let me ask you to elaborate maybe in a couple of areas. Uh, you have quite rightly, of course, stressed the need to go beyond fiscal austerity to marry it with growth strategies. Tell us a little more about your growth strategy both for Italy and for Europe. What is a reasonable expectation for resumed economic growth in Italy? Once the fiscal consolidation takes place, your structural reforms begin to take effect, what could we look for as a, uh, a growth target for Italy over the coming medium term? And can you give us any estimates of the extent to which the reforms you are now putting in place might generate that growth? Any quantitative estimates or even guesstimates on uh, what kind of payoff from your policies? And then at the European level, in your, your fascinating interview that was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, you talked, as you did some today, about the need for Europe as a whole to adopt structural reform, including Germany. Elaborate a little bit there, too. What specifics do you have in mind? What are the priorities? And what could be the payoff in terms of a resumption of European growth within the next two or three years? Yes. Um, <laughs> The prospect for growth uh, in uh, Italy, um, the, well, first of all, growth uh, in Italy will be necessary not only for the sake of growth and uh, the reduction of unemployment uh, in themselves, but also in order to make uh, the improved budgetary situation sustainable. And I think it's very interesting that since about one year, even the rating agencies are putting much more emphasis on uh, growth as a necessary condition for, uh, for, uh, the, 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 for budgetary sustainability. Um, Of course, we are not putting in place a strategy for growth from the, uh, from the uh, demand side, uh, but what, what do I mean? That certainly we are not uh, uh, compensating the deteriorating uh, uh, estimates for real economic growth in Italy and elsewhere in 2012 by uh, additional demand stimuli. Clearly, we are not doing this. But uh, I believe that uh, if uh, the markets uh, see the improvements in the policy outlook for Italy and in the sustainability of the budget, they will uh, deliver a uh, um, benefit to Italy in the form of lower interest rates. Uh, we have been plagued by a very high interest rate on uh, uh, medium and long-term treasury bonds, uh, much above, I mean, uh, the, the, the spread between the 10-year treasury bonds and the Bund, the German bonds, uh, uh, reached uh, 574 basis points on November the 9th, the moment in which uh, the political scenario changed in Italy, and since has come down to the 344 of this morning, um, which, uh, uh, which uh, deserves two, two remarks. One. Uh, the coming down of short-term interest rates has been much more remarkable, much, much uh, bigger. Uh, and this leads many people to believe that uh, there are some uh, political uncertainties that are keeping up the longer-term uh, interest rates linked to what, uh, what might happen after the new uh, elections in Italy. 
Uh, but there I would like to be a bit reassuring uh, and one element which goes in this direction, many of you will have seen it, uh, is the interview that uh, Mr. Berlusconi gave to the Financial Times last week uh, uh, supporting more openly than ever before the current government and uh, committing to this support over in, in the medium term. Now everything can change but I think this provides Italy with a perspective of stability in that particular political sector where most people were seeing a potential source of instability. At any rate, interest rates are coming down more the short term than the longer term. I believe that if this Greece uh, potential um, explosive gets out of the way, um, this, uh, will, uh, this process of decline in interest rates will uh, accelerate and hence I think uh, we carve out through what we did on the budget uh, a bit of a support for growth through lower interest rates on treasuries but also indirectly on bank loans to companies. And then there is the more supply side uh, we saw the, uh, a work done by the OECD on structural reforms, one of their fields of specialty, but they did a specific uh, work on the sort of liberalization measures that Italy has been now introducing. Uh, they come to, uh, they and other studies of the Bank of Italy come to uh, the conclusion that uh, uh, this opening up of markets uh, could altogether generate a 10-11% uh, increase in productivity, uh, half of which could be there in the first three years alone, so also relatively in the short term. Uh, then of course we have to hope that the uh, global and European policy stance becomes more growth generating, hence our efforts vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis the European level. And I come here to your second part about structural reforms beyond Italy, structural reforms at the EU level, including Germany. Well, I think that uh, there is a lot to be done in terms of structural reforms country by country, which is in the responsibility of the various governments. Uh, but also in part uh, under the leverages of the European uh, Commission. For example, the fact that the European Commission has now opened infringement procedures, that is, is putting legal and political stimulus on countries to comply with the services directive, liberalizing the services area. And they issued uh, most recently two infringement procedures symbolically enough, one vis-a-vis -vis Germany, the other one vis-a-vis -vis Greece, says that uh, uh, even in Germany there is scope for greater domestic liberalization. And uh, something I, uh, I normally try to convey to our Anglo-Saxon friends, there is not much hope to persuade Germany to play the growth game through uh, a more Keynesian uh, frame of mind, uh, but uh, I think they are more likely to respond positively if one calls them to fully go in the direction of their, of their invention, the social market economy of the 50s and the 60s, open up markets, and I believe that if Germany uh, fully went to the opening up of its domestic services uh, sector, that will uh, uh, stimulate its own growth as well as through increased exports of services from other EU member states to Germany, the whole of, of uh, uh, European growth. Uh, but lastly, there are some policies at the EU level, not domestic structural reforms of member states, but policies at the EU level, uh, which have, in my view, to change in order to reflect this growth orientation now that we are no longer an indisciplined continent, but actually the most virtuous in the world in terms of budgets. 
and that means in particular uh, much more resources devoted, many more resources devoted to the EU budget and to uh, cross-border infrastructures, for example. And I, although I happen to be also a finance minister, I, I will not buy the argument put forward by my colleagues, the finance ministers, saying, OK, the EU uh, puts a lot of pressures on us to contain the national budgets. Uh, certainly, we are not ready to have uh, in the future a, um, a, a, a greater EU budget. But I think this makes no sense, because it is a matter of economies of scale and of provision of public goods. Uh, uh, some of which can only be provided at, at the level of the EU. So I think it will be important, but will imply a difficult change in mentality, and we are working towards that. Uh, important uh, that uh, the whole of the EU policy stance becomes more growth-oriented, and this will, in the end, also generate some uh, demand expansion across Europe, without which purely supply-side uh, uh, reforms will not in themselves generate growth. Uh, let, let me ask you again to elaborate on a couple of the comments you just made about the evolution of Europe. Um, you are now Prime Minister of Italy, but for a long time you've been one of the architects of Europe. You've been on many commissions, you've written many reports about the future of Europe, not to mention your 10 years implementing Europe as a commissioner. As Europe works its way through the current crisis, what do you see as the medium to long run outlook for the European Union as a whole and for the future prospects of the integration exercise. I mean, many of us have observed that Europe has faced many crises over its five or six decades. Some were existential. Out of all those, Europe did seem to come out stronger and move forward. Will that happen this time? I think this is happening this time already. Um, we are moving perhaps without being aware, towards some degree of even political union. The crisis has brought about an unexpected acceptance by national governments of a much greater coordination at the EU level of national budgetary policies. Since last year, the so-called European semester is in place. This means that each of our governments has to submit to the European Commission and to the European Council of Ministers in the first half of the year, before it goes to the national parliament, a draft budget. This is incredible if you think of it. This was asked by the European Commission for years and years and always rejected by member states. Uh, isn't this uh, a vulnus to the sovereignty of parliaments? Well, it may be a vulnus, but now it is in place. So this is one, one aspect. Then uh, the, uh, the ac acceptance of uh, a much enhanced economic surveillance on even the process of structural reforms in member states. So there is an acceptance of more uh, operational instruments of supervision by the uh, EU. So the, uh, the, the in itself slow structure of the 27 or of the 17 members of, of the euro area uh, has moved, has moved considerably, thanks, one should say, to the Greek crisis. Uh, and if I look uh, in, in five years' uh, time, I would imagine a, a 
euro area that uh, would uh, have uh, a composition uh, more numerous than the current one. I don't see, honestly, countries uh, going out of the euro. I see some countries coming in the euro uh, in the next few years. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, the permanent uh, um, crisis management system, the ESM, uh, which uh, we will uh, put in place soon, uh, will be there as an ordinary instrument for crisis management. The EU was not constructed to manage crisis and it was a big deficiency and this crisis forced us to update the machinery. Uh, I, I believe that we will see a shift uh, in the competences, a shift in the functions, what Brussels does relative to the member states, with some areas moving up. For example, there is slow process, which in my view will accelerate concerning tax coordination, a very sensitive topic, but it is going ahead. And uh, uh, so tax policy will be slightly more centralized, but on the other hand, some policies which have been run in Brussels for decades as if uh, it were in an incubator are now ready to be delivered in a network, uh, in a governance through network system. This is the case of competition policy, which in 2004, which uh, was uh, largely outsourced to the national competition authorities, although keeping a Brussels uh, coordination. So I, I, I would imagine a Europe which will be not necessarily more cumbersome, but uh, uh, focusing on its core business. The core business of Europe will evolve over time, um, but the ability to respond to crisis, uh, uh, luckily enough, is still there. Um, the, the, the worst case scenario, of course, would be to have crises and no ability to respond to them. The best case scenario would uh, be to have an ability to modernize your structures even without crisis. We are not so virtuous yet. Uh, I have one more question that I want to open it up. Um, you met with the congressional leadership this morning. You're going directly from here to the White House to meet with President Obama. What can the United States, the rest of the world more broadly, do to help you? And is there any specific role for the International Monetary Fund in coming back into the picture, as it did at the outset of the crisis, to help support uh, the resumption of stability? Um, this is a moment where the German Chancellor has for two months uh, very constructively asked me what can we do more for you and maybe this will also be the question by President uh, Obama and in fact it did come up also in the meetings this morning with the congressional leadership. Um, I think Italy is not uh, in a state uh, where it needs uh, financial support, um, but it needs better governance and it wants to contribute to better governance. This uh, has largely to be achieved within Europe. For example, I think we came to a, a deep common understanding with uh, Germany that uh, anything which would improve the perceptions by the markets that uh, the Eurozone is well governed in terms of readiness to put up uh, adequate firewalls uh, will actually imply uh, a very small probability that such uh, financial resources would have to be used because they would be credible enough for the mere fact that they are uh, there. Uh, with the US, 
I think uh, uh, this will be the topic of my conversations in, uh, I don't know, I hope I'm not be late to the White House. Uh, we'll get you there on time. <laughs> um, how, uh, given the fact that the US is struggling to have budgetary consolidation, as we would call it, and is oriented towards growth, and we are doing exactly the same in a different institutional context, how we can uh, develop synergies in order to uh, do this more uh, easily. Uh, as to the IMF, well, there is a prominent figure of the IMF uh, in this uh, uh, room. I, say, I would say that uh, the IMF uh, is, uh, is playing a very key and constructive uh, role. I think uh, the IMF uh, is uh, right when it says uh, concerning uh, um, crisis management and, and uh, uh, financial firewalls, uh, we uh, cannot uh, do more vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe unless the Europeans uh, uh, give proof of believing in themselves enough and uh, doing uh, themselves what they can do in terms of firewalls. I think this is a correct attitude uh, where I perhaps would see a room for um, improvements also on the part of the IMF would be in uh, uh, having a broader understanding of specific situations in which uh, the strict adherence to a uh, model might prevent a pragmatic solution of, the, of a problem. Now, I don't have the latest details about the agreement uh, reached by the Troika with uh, Prime Minister Papadimos uh, and of the agreement between him and the three political parties, but uh, it is my understanding that uh, Many of us in Europe, including uh, the member states which uh, traditionally are on the side of caution and of discipline, uh, believe that this is the moment to uh, consider that uh, if there is a, a minimum of compliance with the requirements uh, uh, set out, this is a moment to turn the page and to um, extinguish this uh, potential Greek uh, explosion. Okay, the floor is open. We've got two standing mics in the back. We have a couple of traveling mics here. Please identify yourself and then uh, fire away. Okay, we've got a question in the back and one over here. John Dyser with the Financial Times. The Greek program will apparently include a retroactive collective action clause, in other words, a retroactive rewriting of bond contracts. Won't this impose a risk for bondholders and therefore a higher price for issuers of local law bonds, such as Italy or any other, uh, current, uh, any other deficit country? Isn't there a risk for uh, issuers, aside from Greece, uh, who will now have to pay more because of the Greece's rewriting of contract law. Of course, it was originally uh, uh, denied by Greece and by the ECB that this would happen. Now that it has, how credible is the assertion that it will be confined just to Greece? In other words, isn't there a cost to the rest of the European issuers for this rewriting of bond contracts? Um, two uh, things. Uh, one, I think at uh, the highest political level it uh, has been clearly said that uh, this uh, role given to the PSI after the Deauville meeting between Germany and France uh, um, has caused a lot of problems and uh, will uh, not uh, become a, a permanent feature of policies. Secondly, uh, 
don't you believe, I am returning the question to you if I may, don't you believe that uh, the uh, risk of uh, countries rewriting contracts uh, was already largely incorporated in the markets uh, and therefore in interest rates uh, already? I happen to think that the answer would have to be yes. So I don't expect uh, that this would uh, worsen the uh, position of the Italian Treasury in the market. Uh, whereas I do think that uh, once this page is turned, uh, the benefit will be considerable for uh, every issuer and for the markets overall themselves. Next question over here, Nancy. Uh, Nancy, Nancy Jacqueline, Johns Hopkins Sides. Um, when you responded to Fred's question on the future of European integration, you didn't talk about the banking sector issues. And we now have the uh, banking supervisor uh, assessing the, the results of the stress tests um, and determining what they think is needed. But in terms of getting those outcomes, it's up to the individual states to try to figure out what has to be done. And I wonder, in looking at the future, what you see is needed in terms of greater harmonization and strength of the central banking structure. Yeah, very important point, and I think uh, many politicians in Europe thought uh, our friend Tommaso Padoaschioppa was too visionary when he was uh, invoking uh, a real EU-level supervisory structure. Then uh, events uh, uh, proved that uh, he was uh, visionary but highly realistic. And in fact, Europe has gradually moved towards that uh, direction with uh, the La Rosière report and the subsequent policy decisions. But I think you're absolutely right. I should have mentioned this because in the area, I mean, the, bank, the banking <coughs> sector is illustrative uh, of uh, two things. One, that uh, uh, when I was saying earlier that there has been a disaffection for integration or a a rejection of integration. Well, the, uh, the European banking system until three, four, five years ago had undergone a very remarkable process of cross-border integration. Then, following the crisis, uh, the, the wish to stay closer to father and mother uh, has prevailed and uh, the the states, the treasuries being the source of uh, uh, rescue money has induced uh, banks to retrench to some extent. And so there has been more fragmentation in the uh, uh, European banking system. And that is also, well, part that, that is because two elements of the European construction are not pronounced uh, enough yet. One is uh, that there is still big room for uh, state aid, uh, which is state aid, not EU-wide aid. And secondly, there is this uh, uh, ambivalent, uh, ambiguous situation where uh, banking uh, Supervision, uh, supervision is half-baked between the real EU level and the national level. So thank you for raising this. Uh, Europe uh, will, will not make a decisive forward step <coughs> towards being an integrated single market with the appropriate policy instruments at the EU level. Uh, until this, this is remedied. As the Prime Minister said, we have to be sure that he gets to the White House on time, uh, and he also has to have a bite of lunch. So we have time only for two quick questions. Uh, the two at the head of the queue, ask your questions one right after the other, and the Prime Minister can choose how to respond to the two. Mr. Prime Minister, you uh, described Germany as Mario Platero, Il Sole 24 Ore. Mr. Prime Minister, you described Germany as being a social market economy. Uh, you said that uh, the central government in Europe should become bigger. 
Uh, don't you fear that you, uh, your message may be taken in the wrong way within the Republican candidates? And uh, uh, more seriously, how do you respond to the constant allegations we hear uh, in the debate here that Europe is a socialist country and America is moving in that direction? Uri, go ahead and then ask the second question, then respond, and that will uh, be it. Oui, Dadush, the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, my question is, uh, again, regarding Germany, but somewhat different. Germany has grown quite rapidly, but runs a large current account surplus. Italy has grown relatively slowly and has quite a large current account deficit, around 3.5% of GDP. Is this a sign of major, major competitiveness loss of Italy vis-a-vis -vis Germany and vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? And how does your plan, beyond structural reforms, which take a long time to work, uh, actually deal with that problem? Yep. Um, on, uh, can I take the second, uh, the, 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 the second Please question? Please do. The, the second question first. Uh, yes, the answer is unambiguously yes. And uh, um, Italian uh, entrepreneurs and top managers in this room will probably uh, confirm that uh, Italy has accumulated a uh, sizable uh, worsening of competitiveness. Um, and that explains to a large extent why Italy for the last uh, 12 or 15 years uh, had, had, has had an, an average rate of growth uh, about one half that of the euro area, not of the BRICS, of the euro area. Um, structural reforms uh, play only in the long term Yes and no, because as uh, coming out of the uh, Bank of Italy and the OECD estimates I gave uh, earlier, some effects of structural reforms can come up rather quickly. And I think the direction of policy has really to look at total factor productivity, as you economists uh, would call it, uh, which, uh, which means uh, that a lot of work has been done in the field of the labor market uh, in order to facilitate uh, increases in productivity there and a closer uh, relationship between rewards and, and, and productivity. But also a lot has, been has to be done by remedying to uh, um, elements of lack of competitiveness which are outside the firm, like uh, inadequate infrastructures, like uh, uh, huge uh, bureaucratic burdens. Uh, true, each of these can play out its effect only in the relatively long term. But I think that uh, international investors, the markets, uh, are uh, watching very closely what each country does or does not uh, in these areas. And uh, uh, I perceive uh, uh, a, a, a view of Italy in the international business community as the view of a country which has very, very strong fundamentals in many respects, uh, which uh, compare very well with those of other countries, particularly in Europe. Uh, I will not list them here. Uh, uh, but uh, they are prevented from generating actual growth because of these uh, uh, constraints. And I believe that once the markets will be convinced that things will change and have started changing, I think they will, and I hope, of course, that they will accelerate this process by moving in, like uh, on Treasury bonds. I'm not here to promote uh, them. Um, my deputy finance minister is now in New York working also towards that. But uh, the, uh, given the, the current levels of uh, still high 5.5% rates on uh, medium to long term treasury bonds in Italy, if really one is perceived that Greece is moving outside of the uh, of the problem area, 
uh, and that uh, this policy process in Italy is going to continue and to achieve its results, well, many people tell me once we reach this conviction there is a remarkable room out there for uh, capital gains on Italian uh, treasury bonds. So I think something similar, not at that speed, could happen as to uh, achieving rather early on the benefits from pro-competitiveness policies. Uh, German, well, German growth, the question, well, is this a, 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 a lunch speech on Germany? No, no. it's not. I, I, <laughs> I spoke already too much in Germany, uh, about Germany, sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, the first question by Mr. Platero brings us inevitably to Germany again, I'm sorry. Uh, did I describe the... Well, if Europe has the model of a social market economy, and if, uh, if I say that there will be a heavier government in Brussels for Europe, uh, how will this resonate, uh, especially with the Republicans? in Congress and in the US. Um, um, Mr. Platero is an eminent journalist, so he's more inclined to sharpening uh, 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 views than in following uh, sophisticated uh, uh, <laughs> ifs and buts. But, uh, but uh, uh, the, the uh, the social market economy contains the market in it. For many of our countries in Europe, as they were before the full impact of social, in uh, of social, of European integration, uh, the what Europe really brings is a much more pro-market orientation. Most of our domestic liberalizations in the network industries and elsewhere has have has have been achieved because of Europe. So Europe has been a powerful factor for liberalizing the uh, EU uh, economy. And, uh, um, and so speaking about the social market economy, if done in the appropriate context, uh, is not underlining uh, a socialistizing uh, effect of European integration, on the contrary. Um, equally for the government of Europe, I just said, uh, Mario, that uh, some functions will have to go up to Brussels, others can be devolved uh, from Brussels to the national, uh, the national capitals or indeed the regions. So no, I do not expect a heavier Brussels uh, government. But uh, it is true that uh, the borderline between socialism and pro-market attitudes is very thin and mobile. I always remember a day in 2001 uh, the previous day uh, I was commissioner for competition in Brussels, the previous day I had uh, blocked uh, the GE Honeywell merger and uh, rejected a uh, French state aid to a company. And so uh, I was described uh, uh, as paleo-socialist in the uh, US press and as a, ne as a neoliberal, a dangerous neoliberal in the French press. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, we could obviously go on all day. We wish you the best of luck. We are with you. We support you. We hope and pray for your success. And we're welcoming you to the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much.